Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard each day, not satisfied with just a little religion in life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As our series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Welcome. Our theme for our time together today, Why Women Need Men. As we hear, Gateway to Joy, number three in a series, Appreciation for Men. Also, part four, The Sorrows of Men. We'll be hearing from one of the brothers of Elizabeth, Jim Howard, as he talks about happy childhood memories of his sister and about a nickname that she gave him. Also, we'll hear from another Jim, Jim Elliott. We'll hear his voice. He was preaching about the feeding of the 5,000. And as you might expect from a man of action like Jim Elliott, he was saying we need more action. That coming later. Right now, though, let's get to part three in our 10-part series, Appreciation for Men. Why Women Need Men. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking again today about appreciation for men. On Monday, we discussed what men are afraid of. When their worst fears materialize, some of them resort to drugs. Yesterday's letter was that of a repentant wife. Her husband is now unable to make clear decisions. They're already divorced, and she is extremely sorry and wishes with all her heart that she had never made such a move. Now here is a letter from a wife who doesn't have the kind of marriage she wants. Her needs, she says, are being met, things like food and clothes. She has a godly man. He has the fruit of the Spirit in his daily life. He goes to church. He is a deacon. He works hard, 90 to 100 hours a week, and they enjoy being together. But, tragedy struck the family. And now she says, he won't even pray with me. I'm kind to him even when my needs aren't met, she says. Now what happened in this case? The refusal to pray surely would indicate bitterness at God. It also, I think, reveals that prayer was not very real before Or is it fear, once again, guilt and anger? Stop and think how closely intertwined fear and guilt and anger are. Is there someone listening to me today who is very aware of one of those three things? Ask yourself, is it related, perhaps, to the other two? Ought I to confess this to the Lord? and ask him to deliver me. Fear, guilt, and anger, I believe, are very, very closely intertwined. God knows your heart. I don't pretend to read it. But may I say to you as gently and sympathetically as I can, any of you men who find yourselves in a similar position, do you know how much your wife needs you? If she seems distant, and perhaps very judging and unfair and vindictive, what would it mean to her if you just took her in your arms and told her that you need her understanding? Have you ever thought about that? Try taking your wife in your arms and just saying, Honey, maybe you don't realize it, but I need your understanding. If you acknowledged the truth, whatever it is, your fear, your guilt, your anger. Perhaps you're afraid that it would be unmanly to bear your heart to a woman. If she's the woman to whom you're married, I don't think there's anything unmanly about it. In a little book that I read often, I came across these wonderful little quotations, which I want to read to you. Sweet is the smile of home, the mutual look when hearts are of each other sure. 
sweet, all the joys that crowd the household nook, the haunt of all affections, pure. Is there any tie which absence has loosened, or which the wear and tear of every day interaction, little uncongenialities, unconfessed misunderstandings have fretted into the heart until it bears something of the nature of a fetter? Is there any cup at our home table whose sweetness we have not fully tasted, although it might yet make of our daily bread a continual feast? Let us reckon up these treasures while they are still ours in thankfulness to God. The Old English may be a little bit difficult for some, but Elizabeth Charles, the author of this, is speaking of how easy it is to begin to take others for granted when absence loosens a tie or when the wear and tear of everyday life has fretted us until it becomes something of the nature of a fetter, like a bond, a chain, bondage of some sort. Is there any cup at our home table whose sweetness we have not fully tasted? The sweetness of sympathy and mutual understanding. I think it's unreasonable for us ever to expect fully to understand our husbands, or for you husbands fully to understand your wives, because men and women are different. It was God's idea to make us very different. But we can learn to understand each other more and more as we live together and love, because love shows the way. And then another quotation on the same page, we ought daily or weekly to dedicate a little time to the reckoning up of the virtues of our belongings, wife, children, and friends, contemplating them then in a beautiful collection. How many of us do that daily, even weekly, even annually, dedicate a little time to the reckoning up of the virtues of our belongings. And among our belongings, is there anything as precious as wife, children, and friends, husband, home? We should do so now, that we may not pardon and love in vain and too late, after the beloved one has been taken away from us to a better world. When I was married to my husband, Jim Elliott, it was a very brief marriage. It was actually two years and three months. And when he went to try to take the gospel to a group of Indians called Alcas, I had a week to contemplate his absence before he actually died. And in that week at home with my baby, who was then 10 months old, I thought back over my failures as a wife. I realized the very strong possibility that my husband might not return. But I made up my mind that if and when he did, I was going to be the best wife in the world. One thing I realized was that over those 10 months since our baby was born, I hadn't given my husband the kind of attention that I had given him before that. I had been very preoccupied with the baby. And there were times when I could have been sensitive to my husband's needs when I didn't bother. I hadn't darned all his socks. Nowadays, nobody darns socks because everybody wears those one-size-fits-all kind and you can't really darn them very well. So I sat down and darned every sock in the drawer, mended his clothes, fixed things around the house for his sake. It was too late. He never came back. If you don't know how to pray, let me give you the simplest prayer I know. It's called the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. God knows how to answer that prayer. He knows what kind of mercy you need. And all you're doing is just putting yourself in his presence and acknowledging your need. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Is there a man listening whose heart has been pierced by this message, realizing that you haven't appreciated your possessions, your wife, your children, your home, and all that God has given you. Perhaps you're aware that you need to pray. Just pray that prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Or pray the Lord's Prayer. 
Some call it the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know that prayer, don't you? Pray it slowly and thoughtfully. And then another help, especially for you men, is a wonderful leaflet called Do You Love Me? This is the testimony of a man whose love for his wife was completely transformed. He says, It's easy to scorn women, and most men do. We see women as physically weak, easy to intimidate, bound to the menial tasks of motherhood, emotional, illogical, and often petty. Or we see them as temptresses. In desire, we idolize them and parade them across the pages of magazines, yet we scorn and hate them for their commanding sexual power over us. Male scorn for women affects every aspect of our lives. Relations with our mothers, our girlfriends, our secretaries, our wives, our children, the church, and even God himself. I do not speak here merely of your scorn of women, he writes. I speak of mine as well. I swaggered through marriage for many years, ruling my wife, Susan, and my children with an iron hand while citing scripture as justification for my privileges and authority. Years of dominating my wife and children left them habitually resentful and fearful of me, yet unwilling to challenge me because of the fury it might provoke. Then a number of dramatic events occurred that wrought a profound change in my moral, psychological, and spiritual life. My eyes were opened, and during the past five years, my family has been restored. In 1983, we had six children, and despite our spiritual estrangement, Susan was four months pregnant. Our first babies had been born without any problems whatsoever. However, in the early morning hours of December 6th, Susan began to hemorrhage, and within two hours delivered our seventh baby dead. He goes on to tell about this transformation that was wrought in his life, in her life, and the life of their whole family. May God help us, men and women alike, to see with his eyes the gifts that he has given us and to receive them with thanksgiving. Part three in the series, Appreciation for Men. Later on, The Sorrows of Men, as we look at part four there. We'll be hearing from Jim Elliott, actually his own voice, if you've never heard him, a minute and a half or so of a sermon on the feeding of the 5,000 and the need for action. Uh, Some happy childhood memories now, though, as we hear from a different Jim, Jim Howard, brother of Elizabeth, as he talks about a nickname that his sister gave him. There were little ways that she took care of me. Because, of course, at times, when she was home from college, I was still pretty young. Uh, My parents might be off for a prayer meeting on an evening, and they would give her the responsibility of taking care of me and getting me to bed. So she did that, and uh, I have happy memories of that. She stuffed me in her bike basket, rode her bike to take me to vacation Bible school. I was a very small child. That was right after the Second World War, and so our vacation Bible school was called Troop School because it had kind of a military atmosphere about it. My sister riding her bike up to the church, a number of blocks, carrying me in her basket might surprise some people. She had nicknames for both my brother Thomas and me, and sometimes she would call me Squash Bucket. I said, why do you call me that? She said, because you're a little pale. So that was another memory of my early childhood. Jim Howard, brother of Elizabeth. Later on, we'll hear from the first husband of Elizabeth, Jim Elliott, as we hear a quick excerpt from his message on the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, that coming later. First, though, part four of Appreciation for Men, The Sorrows of Men. Isaiah 53 talks about how surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
we read in Revelation 21 that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. No more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Here's Elizabeth with a look at the sorrows of men. I have a letter from a woman who says she prays for her husband's salvation, but she is refusing to forgive certain people. Is it surprising that her husband is not interested in salvation as long as his wife is acting in such an obviously sinful way? This woman acknowledges in her letter to me that her husband sees this and has not become a Christian. The most powerful way that we can draw others to Jesus Christ is by acting like Christians. The most powerful way that we can turn them away, surely, is by acting unchristianly. Another woman writes to tell me of her husband's anger, and she says, ironically, my husband leads an anger control group. Well, that sounds like something a good many men might feel they needed to join. I wonder if they would, if they knew what that wife wrote to me. She says, just the other day, we had a fight. I said a lot of angry words, such as, I want a divorce. My husband knows I didn't mean it, but he takes it hard every time. He tortures me by not talking to me for two weeks. Every time he is angry. He even turns to pornography to let out his anger. I told him I was sorry in about two days, but his anger will last until I absolutely have to get down to beg him to forgive me. It's very humiliating. Both of us are at fault. But I don't have any friends or family to talk to. I can't hold the anger as long as he does, and any good Christian should not hold it that long. Well, let me put in a parenthesis here that the Bible says that we are not to go to bed angry. So, obviously, we ought not ever to hold the anger more than one day. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Several times she says, I felt like I was going crazy because his heart is like a stone when I try to love him. When I ask for his forgiveness, sometimes it is not even my fault. I patiently wait for him And sometimes two weeks go by before he gets rid of his hurt and anger. What else can I do? I tried everything you said to do. My husband is so stubborn, so unforgiving. His anger lasts forever. My question is, how can two people who claim to love God and want to serve God be the most miserable people together? Well, you know, the answer is simple. Not easy, but simple. And by that I mean we understand what God is saying when he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put it away. Don't work through it. Don't excuse yourself on the basis that the other person is even angrier than you are. Cut it out. Quit it. Stop. That's what the Bible says. Now here's a letter from a husband. He says, For years, whenever a disagreement has come up with my wife, I've always apologized and said I'm sorry, even when I felt I wasn't at fault. But I've about come to the end of my rope. I'm tired of apologizing when I have nothing to apologize for. I'm tired of saying sorry just to get my wife to speak to me. Most days, I'd just like to move to the rooftop just to find some peace. I'm not sure at this moment what I'd do if God were ever to take his hands off me. I am convinced myself, this is Elizabeth talking now, that the greatest sorrow that can come in a family is divorce. Anger is a dangerous thing because very often it leads to adultery. And adultery leads to divorce. Adultery, I think, is a way of getting back at that person who has been so angry with you. You find someone who is sympathetic and kind and open and loving, and you go to bed with them. Isn't that the truth? You who have committed adultery, what were your motives? Was it merely because you wanted a variety in your life? You wanted a little excitement? Was there not, perhaps, down deep, 
some anger or fear or guilt that made you feel retaliatory to that other person? You want to show them. You want to get back at them. You want to make the other one feel regret. So you kick over the traces and you punish the other person. And here's a letter from a man who was actually in the Green Berets. This is what he says. I have gone through the most terrible experience of my life. My wife left me for another man. I was listening to you on the radio about Glenda's story and how she was compelled to pick up the Christian literature. I about jumped out of my chair at work because I was compelled to pick up and read a Bible my parents had given me in the army. This was before I knew my wife was having an affair. When I found out, I wanted to be dead, and I went into deep depression for the first time in my life. I knew I needed help, so I asked God to help me and started going to church. I have asked Jesus to be my Savior, and I have gone through so many changes in nine months that I feel like a new man, born again. That realization blew my mind. Anyway, I listen to you on the radio along with others, and I cannot learn enough. Your program is helping me grow, and I just wanted to thank you for what you're doing. You're helping an ex-army captain of the infantry and a Green Beret who thought he could handle anything for himself, but who was slapped down into the dirt and found out he was nothing without God. And he says, please let me know how to obtain Glenda's story. Glenda's story is that of a woman who had a very different experience from this Green Beret. She had an abused background with all sorts of other horrifying things. But the way she dealt with it is so different from what we are hearing from the world. She found the efficacy of the blood of Jesus, the effectiveness of the cross. It's a wonderful story of a transformed life. Let me read to you a little bit from Mark chapter 10, where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees who came and asked him a test question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, Jesus said. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus said it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote this law. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Those are clear, stern words, aren't they? Let me read a little bit more from the leaflet called, Do You Love Me? This man testifies to the ways in which their home was completely transformed and his love for his wife completely changed because of the great sorrow that came into their home when they lost their seventh child. What a shock. At two in the morning, in a stark, bright hospital delivery room, I held in my hand my tiny, lifeless son and stared in disbelief at his death. What an injustice. Others should have died, not he. I should have died, not he. I was guilty, but alive. He was innocent, but dead. In an instant, as never before, I saw that there is deeply rooted in this universe an evil that afflicts even the most innocent. And I realized that many things are simply beyond my power. I could not raise my poor baby from the dead. 
and I could not command my wife's love. In that same instant, I was forced to choose, either to rage against the universe that contained this evil, to hate it for harming and killing my baby, or to acknowledge that although this evil existed, and although I was powerless to undo many of its effects or fend off many of its attacks, other things remained very much within my power and under my influence. I had the power to make my wife's life worse by raging or to make them better by learning to love properly. I had to choose. That was part four in the series Appreciation for Men, The Sorrows of Men. Well, we're almost out of time, but we do have a minute and a half or so that we can hear from Jim Elliott, his own voice, as he preached about the feeding of the 5,000. And as you might expect from a man of action like Jim Elliott, he said we needed more action. Because I'm persuaded that what we need is not higher doctrine, not more truth concerning Christ, not finer lines of distinction about his person, although, although there are such to be found. There are in the reaches of the person of Christ and the riches of his work, such that would, as eternity does, tease us out of thought. And I don't pretend to propose those to you this afternoon. For I feel that what we need is not new truth, not higher truth, but we need to fill the truth that we now have with action. We need to put content in what we already believe. It's very unfortunate that among those who gather as we do, there is the accusation that we have higher truth, but we have lesser morals. There is the accusation that though we possess better doctrine, we have slower devotion. And though it may be that we have a better understanding of the book of Ephesians, yet we have a very poor practice of the book of Proverbs. And so I understand from this that what we need is not higher truth, since truth in itself is not the thing which liberates us to live godly lives. What we need is to fill already what we know with content and power and reality, that thing we have not. Doctrine, we have a plenty. Truth is rampant. Knowledge, effectual. But reality, we lack. And that is in my own conscience as well as in yours. That was Jim Elliott in a message about the feeding of the 5,000. Well, our time together is just about over, but thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, along with you as you jogged wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org Here's a quick note from one of our listeners. I'm so thankful for the life of Elizabeth Elliot. She was an obedient servant of Christ. I always look forward to the podcast. She has become a spiritual mother to me via Apple Podcasts. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms 